I'm going to start a new series today. It kind of has an odd name. It talks about uh, learning how to break things. Some of you are pretty good at that already. You probably don't need any coaching on how to break things. Any of you have ever broken something really valuable? Yeah, something perhaps very sentimental, something irreplaceable, something like that. Yeah, I see a few hands. Well, if, if you're interested in this series in sharing a time when you just really, you really blew it and you broke something valuable or you broke something with a lot of sentimental value or something uh, precious and irreplaceable or just when you were dumb <clears throat> and broke something. If you want to share any of those with me, I won't use your name, but I might use your story as in this series as we talk about uh, breaking things. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you one of my stories today. When, uh, when I was a very brilliant 14-year-old kid, <clears throat> and if you have any stories you want to send, email them to me. Don't put them on Facebook because I will never see them. I don't do Facebook, uh, so email them to me. I was 14 years old, <clears throat> and my older brother and I decided we were going to re-roof our house. And so... He's uh, six years older than I am, so, you know, he, he should have known what he was doing at least. And uh, <clears throat> summertime, really hot, and uh, we were up on the roof working one day, and I was careless, and I, and I let my hammer slide off the roof. Well, instead of getting down <clears throat> and getting the hammer myself, my mom was out in the yard. And so, yeah, you can see this is going somewhere bad, right? Uh, my mom was out in the yard, and I said, hey, mom, would you get the hammer and, and throw it back up to me? And I, I never knew that my mom played softball, but, <laughs> but, but she began to wind that hammer up like she was going to throw a, a, a major league uh, underhand fastball, and instead of letting go up here <clears throat> so the hammer came up to me on the roof, she let go about right there, and there was a window right there the window to my bedroom. Had old rusty screens on the window, so it was no match for that flying hammer, and it plowed right through the screen, <clears throat> right through the window, and landed on my bed. Well, that night, uh, time to go to bed, we didn't have air conditioning, so it didn't matter <clears throat> that there was a hole in the window because I was going to raise the window anyway. And so I raised the window to let more air in, and it was so hot, I, I decided I would sleep on top of the covers, and I never thought anything about a hole in the screen. It didn't even dawn on me. And about 2 o'clock that night, <clears throat> you know how you just kind of get half awake and you're not sure if something's happening or not? And, and I, I wasn't sure if, it, if I was dreaming or if it was happening, but I thought I felt something on my foot. And I thought, nah, you know, I'm just, I'm just dreaming, imagining that. So I drifted off back to sleep, <clears throat> and about 15 minutes later or so, I, I thought I felt it again, and I was a little more awake this time, and so I thought, I'm just going to make sure that, you know, this is just a dream, and so I reached over and turned the, the lamp on on my nightstand, and I was not imagining it. Sitting on my foot, nibbling at my toes was a bat. You haven't lived <clears throat> until you've awakened in the middle of the night to find a bat. They're kind of creepy anyway, aren't they, you know, and there's this bat, and, and I'm pretty sure, because I woke my mom up, I screamed like a, like a little girl, because <clears throat> it scared me. And I jerked my foot, and the bat flew into my closet and hid. And I thought, man, I got a problem. I, I need some rest, and I'm not going to get any rest, and there's no place else to sleep. And so my mom comes, and what, what's wrong? I said, Mom, don't worry about it. There's a bat in here, and I got a plan, <clears throat> and... And I'm going back in there, and either me or that bat's not coming out alive. I mean, I'm, I'm mad. And uh, so my plan was I went to the front porch, and I got my baseball bat. Now, I didn't say it was a good plan. I said it was a plan, okay? Remember, I'm 14, and it's the middle of the night. So I figure I'm going in there, <clears throat> and I'm shutting the door so the bat can't go anywhere else in the house, and, and I'm going to get that bat with a bat. And so I did. I went back in there. And, and I discovered, though, the bat didn't light the light on. So what does the bat do when the light's on? The bat stays hidden in my closet. So I can't get the bat to come out until I turn the light off and stand still for a while. And then the bat comes out. And I don't know if you've ever tried to hit a bat with a bat, but it's, it's pretty difficult. 
you know, and they dart all over the place and, and the light's off. And so I turn the light on, bat hides, turn the light off, I can't hit the bat. Finally, it was a miracle from God, I'm sure. I finally hit that bat with the bat. <clears throat> and I stunned it enough that I could carry it outside. And I'll put this politically correctly in case there are bat lovers in the room. I did not release it. How, do, how does that sound? There was one less bat in the world after that night. Now, <clears throat> went back to my bedroom, and in the excitement and, and in the adrenaline of, of waking up to a bat on my foot and trying to hit the bat with a bat, I didn't realize my room looked like a bomb had gone off. <laughs> and literally, I promise you, I had broken my bedside lamp. I broke a glass of water that I had brought in, and I broke the globe on the ceiling light. <laughs> but I got rid of that bat. And I got rid of that bat because I was willing to break some things. And let me tell you, there's sometimes things in our life that we need to be willing to break some things in order to get rid of it. <clears throat> and that's kind of what we're talking about today. And I, I, right now, I just want you to hang on to that story. And I want you to go to the Bible, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, find verse 3. <clears throat> if you didn't bring a Bible... You need to see these verses, great verses. Open, uh, open one of our Bibles. There, I promise you there's a Bible under a chair in front of you somewhere. And if you turn to page 821, that will get you close to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. We're just going to read verses 3, 4, and 5. Oh, thank you very much. My own kids never did that for me. <clears throat> Thank you. You're tired of me clearing my throat, right? <laughs> All right. We'll see if that helps. All right. 2 Corinthians 10, we'll start with verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. <clears throat> there is a word in there that describes, that, that defines what, what it is we need to break. There is a word in those verses that uh, <clears throat> some of these things on this board represent. These are from our cardboard confessions last week. We're, we're, we, we wrote down in a symbolic way on little pieces of cardboard what, what sin we, we need to deal with or what uh, uh, struggle God has got us through or what's something that God has already forgiven. <clears throat> but some of these up here represent more than an occasional sin. Some of these represent uh, sins that, that people are stuck in. Uh, you know, lying, uh, Fear, fear that paralyzes, anger, pornography, hate, uh, worry, uh, evil. I mean, just, just a lot of things up here that represent more than just a, a passing sin. And I don't know if, if yours is up here or not. We just took a marker and wrote bigger on some of the cardboard we got turned in last week. But whether or not yours is up here or not, the word that represents... Uh, these things in, from that verse is the word strongholds. That's what we have to learn to break. And this, this verse is, these verses talk about demolishing strongholds, breaking them, not, not injuring them or pecking at them, or, but breaking them. And, and it calls strongholds arguments, every pretension, basically anything that sets itself up for God, a stronghold, we've got to understand what it is. It is not a passing sin. A stronghold literally means fortress. It is a strong point that evil sets up in our life. It's like a base of operations that evil, the devil and his, and his demonic helpers under the right conditions that they can set up in our life 
and, and it kind of serve as a, a base camp from which they can operate to spread evil and temptation in our life. <clears throat> it's not occasional. A stronghold is a persistent sin. It might be a persistent thought. Uh, somewhere up here is, is lust. Lust always involves thinking. It, sometimes looking, but, but you don't even have to look to lust. It can just be the thought. And it's not passing lust. It's somebody who is caught up in lust. It, so a stronghold can be just a thought. It can be an action. It, it can be the pornography that's up here. Somebody who gauges in that. It can be the, the language that somebody references up here. Not an occasional slip of the tongue, but somebody whose language is characterized by filthiness and foulness. Or it can be, it can be an emotion that we don't handle correctly. Not an occasional emotional outburst. We all do that. But someone who has a chronic problem with anger. You know, there's no sin with emotion until we don't handle it correctly. Jesus said, be angry and sin not. So anger is neutral until we do something with it. And some people uh, constantly respond with anger, not just occasionally get angry, but they're an angry person. Jealousy is up here. Some people are eaten up with jealousy, not just occasionally touched by it, but, but they just have a chronic uh, problem with it. Fear. We're all afraid sometimes. But some people live in fear. We're not designed to do that. Living in fear is sinful. It might be guilt from the past that you, you just, you're persistently attacked by guilt from the past. It might be uh, something that, that didn't even start as your sin, something that someone did to you. You didn't like it, didn't want it, didn't ask for it, and it was their sin. Someone who introduced something to you, that's their sin. But when we take it, it becomes ours. And when somebody has done something to you in the past that you didn't ask for, didn't want, didn't like, and that's their sin. But when we take that on and we begin to react to it in ways that are negative for our life, in ways that, that aren't pleasing to God, then it can become a stronghold in our life. So a stronghold is something that, it's one of those things that, uh, that, that you try and try and try and try, but you just can't get rid of it. A stronghold is something we might stop for a while, but then we do it again because it's not passing. Evil has set up a base camp with that sin in our life. A stronghold is something, it's one of those things that we make a promise I'm, I'm going to stop it. Maybe we promise ourselves. Maybe we promise God. Maybe we promise someone else. And then we do it again. And we promise them again. I promise I'll never do it again. We promise ourselves. We promise God. We make commitments. And then we do it again. And, and, and after you've done that for a while, what happens? Then you feel worse than you did before. You feel like more of a failure. Because you really want to stop, but you, but you can't stop. That's a stronghold. You see, and the weapons that we use to, to break strongholds are not the weapons of the world. That means we cannot do it on our own. We have to have the right tools. And in this series, we're going to talk about the right tools. Does, does the devil have any stronghold in your life right now? Is there something chronic, persistent, a thought, an action, a behavior, an emotion that you know is not pleasing to him and you, you, you want rid of it and you've tried and you can't. That's what this series is about. I want to give you a good example of a stronghold. This is a very prevalent stronghold in America today. And it's a dangerous stronghold. It is a hurtful stronghold. And it is a stronghold that I would, I would rather not have to tell this story, but it just, it just fits. In March, Joyce and I went to Tennessee for a pastor's, pastor's wives conference. And uh, some of the sessions we were together, in, in some sessions they separated the wives and husbands. And in one session when the wives were separate, they had this system where if you had a smartphone, they could they asked the women a series of questions and they, they could put in their answer using their smartphone and then the, the data would instantly be uh, tallied and the results would show on the screen. So it was instant feedback from this group. 
And so they were asked a series of questions, and one of the questions asked to these hundreds of pastor's wives was, does your husband have a problem with pornography? And I hope the answer shocks you as much as it did me. 50% of those pastor's wives said yes. Came right up on the screen, yes, 50%. Then they they had a follow-up question. Has your husband ever tried to stop and failed? 50% came up on the screen, yes. That's a stronghold. Now, before you start a rumor that Joyce answered yes to either one of those questions, all right? She did not answer yes to either one of those. I have a lot of problems, but I don't do that, okay? So don't go out of here spreading that. I got enough stuff, all right? But, you know, what does that show? That is a stronghold. That is, that is a persistent sin that, that people are trying to break using the wrong weapons, using the weapons of this world, which is us. And it shows that strongholds can attack anyone. Anybody is susceptible to a stronghold. And so in this series, we're going to talk about how to break those things using the right weapons. Second thing I want us to understand, where do these things always come from? What's the source of a stronghold? And some of you are going to say, well, duh, that's really too obvious because you've already told us. But there's a reason for, for going over this simple point. The source of strongholds is always sin. It's always sin. Now, verse 5 tells us that. Because right after it talks about demolishing strongholds, verse 5 says we demolish what? It's kind of an explanation of what strongholds are. We, we, we demolish thoughts. <clears throat> we demolish ideas. And it basically says we demolish anything that's against God. That's a stronghold. That's a fairly good definition of sin. Anything that's against God. Any thought, any idea, any action, any behavior that's against God, that's sin. The problem with this so obvious point is that there is a growing trend in America today to minimize the seriousness of sin. And in American churches, you can go to some churches now and you'll never hear the word sin. They'll use other words for it. And that trend has been going on and it's getting worse all the time. Let me tell you what. We can't hide from the source of these and deal with them. We have to call them what they are, and we'd have to identify where they started. And at some point, a stronghold can only begin to be built in our lives when we sin. I, don't, I know this, this is hard, but we don't like to hear it, but we're not going to hide from the truth. 1973, 42 years ago, there was a, 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 a doctor who specialized in psychiatry, uh, Carl Menninger, and he's founded a a, a great uh, treatment clinic in Topeka, Kansas. 42 years ago, in in 1973, Menninger wrote a book based upon a trend he saw in America, and he named his book, Whatever Became of Sin. And he wrote his book because he noticed a trend Even 42 years ago, a trend of people avoiding sin, not avoiding doing it, but avoiding calling it what it is. He noticed a trend of people beginning to come up with better sounding names for sin than sin. And that trend has continued today. Some people never sin. They just make a lot of mistakes. I I read a sermon this week by a pastor of a very large church in Texas. He preached it on Easter Sunday of this year. And in that sermon, he called, he called sin bad breath. Sin is like bad breath. And Jesus is the breath mint that makes it smell good again. Come on. Now, I'm sure he meant well. I understand analogies and examples. But, but to me, that... That minimizes sin, and that minimizes what Jesus came here to do. Jesus didn't come to die for my bad breath. I mean, we all have it sometimes, you know. The answer to that, somebody offers your breath, man, take it, okay? But he, he didn't come to die for, for, for that. 
What did Jesus come to die for? Sin. But, but we hear people call sin, well, it's just a mistake. Well, it's a mistake, all right. It's a mistake called sin. You hear people water down sin by saying, well, it was just bad judgment. Well, there's bad judgment involved in every sin. You hear people say, well, it's just a poor choice. Well, if we sin, it is a poor choice, but it's sin. You know, it's just another lifestyle. Well, it is another lifestyle, but it's sin. And so one of the keys to dealing and breaking these things is we can't hide from where they start. They start with sin. Jesus did not come to die for our mistakes. He came to die for our sin. And when we stop calling it what it is, it's an offense to God Almighty. And when we use words that make it less than that, we, we don't have any hope for breaking these things right here. It is what it is. And that's one place we have to start. One more, one more idea today. We're in this series, we're going to work our way up to talking about things that, that don't work to break things and things that do work. But before we get there, we've got one more point today. Where do strongholds begin? That's the source is sin. But, but how do they begin? What's the beginning of a stronghold? Well, strongholds always begin when we give evil a foothold. You don't have to give it all. Just give it a crack. Give it a cre give it one little crevice. Give it a toehold. Give it a foothold. Give it give it a handhold. Just enough to, to 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 be around. Karen, look at the verse. Very simple verse, Ephesians 427. Don't give the devil a foothold. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Don't give it to him. Because that's where, that's where strongholds always begin. They begin with just a, a tiny little crevice that we leave open. Ephesians, or uh, James 1 says, Each person is tempted when by his own de evil desire. See whose sin is it? I, mine, yours. He is dragged away and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Doesn't all start at once, does it? You don't get pregnant one day and have the baby the next, do you, ladies? You probably wish it worked that way, but it kind of has to grow, right? You know, I, I can't say I know how you feel, but there's a process. The seed is planted. The desire is, is, is evil. It plants the seed. Uh, the, the, the pregnancy occurs, and lo and behold, there's a sin. You see, most strongholds don't begin instantly. They begin slowly. If you've ever had a blowout on, your, on, your, on, on a tire when you're driving, you know it instantly. And, and instantly when you get out and look at it, blowout, problem. But most strongholds aren't blowouts. They're slow leaks. The problem is going on every day, every night when you park your car in the driveway. The problem goes on every night until finally one of these days it leaks enough you come out and say, well, how'd that happen? I got a flat. It's been happening. That's the way strongholds are. When we give the devil just a foothold and he begins to erect over time a stronghold, a fortress. It's interesting, the word stronghold always, uh, can also be translated as prison. You ever feel like something in your life has you locked up and you can't break out? It can also be translated as tomb. You ever feel like you're just in a dark place and there's no light and, and, and there's no exit? Well, that didn't happen overnight. The devil took his time to construct those. Most strongholds are, are built over time. So one of the keys to strongholds is don't give the foothold. Well, that means don't sin. That, that's, that's the answer, don't sin. However, we do. I don't care how long you've been a believer in Christ, how mature you are. Remember last week? If you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar. That's what it says. It, it, last week, we, we wrote some of the things we struggled with on cardboard. You remember what I said? If, if your cardboard is blank, it's a lie. So we try not to sin, but when we do, last week tells us confess it quickly so that it doesn't become a foothold. 
Remember what confess it is? God tells you what it is. It's a sin. He convicts you of it. Confess it means, yes, sir, I agree with you. It's a sin. Then what happens? That relationship forgiveness is, is given to us by God and closeness is restored to God again. And the closeness is what we need to keep these things from becoming strongholds. It's, but they always begin with a foothold. They always begin with something small. I, I, I listened to a sermon from a pastor who's been dead many years, uh, Adrian Rogers. Anybody ever heard of him? A great pastor uh, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee of a big church for many years. Had that deep pastor's voice that I don't have. You know, I've got an Arkansas twang, but he sounded like a pastor. And uh, he gave a great example of what a stronghold is and how it begins, just with, just with a little foothold. But you got to pretend, and some of you have trouble with that. I've tried this before. Some of you stopped pretending at all in fourth grade, okay? So pretend with me a little bit today. you got to pretend you own 100 acres of land. And, and in the middle of that 100 acres, somewhere in the middle, is your house. And you've got a nice big house. It's pretty. You, your yard is manicured and beautiful. And you've got a nice, beautiful fence around your yard. And, uh, but not too far from your big, beautiful house, there's a small house. And it sits on a small lot, pretty much in the middle of your property, near your house. And, and we meet. And, and I'd say, hey, man, I'd sure like to, to rent that house from you. And you say, well, sure, I, I invite you to do that. Come on in. And so you, we sign a, a lease, and you rent that for me, to me. And before long, you begin to find out I'm not a very good tenant. I'm not who you thought I was. You know, I do things like on the road that gives me uh, ingress and egress from the property. I throw trash out the windows all the time. And so it's just junk accumulating alongside your road. My washing machine quits working. In Alabama, what do I do with that? I dump it beside the road, right? Uh, I don't keep my yard up very good. Uh, weeds and brush are growing up, and I throw trash in my yard all the time, and I throw trash over the fence into your yard. Sometimes I get on my four-wheeler, and I sneak onto your property, and, and, and I make noise, and I tear up the ground. Uh, I invite my loud friends over to play loud music, and we have loud parties, and, and it disrupts the, the peace and everything. So, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm ruining your whole property a little bit at a time. And I'm not leaving just because you tell me to. Because I don't have to. You can get rid of me. But you have to do it the right way, don't you? There are legal steps to take. You have to use the right weapons. And you have to use the right methods. That is a perfect example of a stronghold. You invited me, and I don't have to leave just because you tell me to. And, and, and the devil's not going to leave. He is not the least bit afraid of us. His helpers don't fear us in the least, but they fear God Almighty, and they fear the right tools. And we can break them. We can, we can make them leave if we use the right weapons. But you see how that started? You just gave me one little spot on your property. You just opened one little crack under your property for me. And now I'm just spreading trash all over the place in your life. But we can break it if we do it the right way.